Okay, today we are going to talk about the benign tumors of the uterus. We know that there are a number of benign tumors of the uterus. Fibroids are the most common one. They are also called uh, fibro, fibromyomas. The other benign tumor is adenomyosis, but we will talk about it in some other lecture. Now, what, what causes the fibroids to occur? The exact cause of the development of fibroids is not known, but it has been said that they are dependent on three factors. Number one, genetic, hormonal and growth factors. They are common in some families because if the mother is having fibroids, the daughters and then the sisters, they can have the fibroids as well. So in this way, they run in the families. The genetic part is also based on the fact that they are due to three chromosomal problems. Number one is translocation between the chromosome 12 and 14 and then deletions of chromosome number 7, trisomy of chromosome number 12 in large tumors. Among the hormonal effects, we all know that fibroids do not occur before menarche and after menopause. They are hormone dependent and the two hormones on which the fibroids are dependent are the estrogen and the progesterone. There are certain growth factors like endodermal growth factors, insulin-like growth factors and so on. These are responsible for the development of fibroids in some patients. The number of, there are a number of estrogen and progesterone receptors inside the uterus. And the estrogen receptors, when present, they increase the expression of progesterone receptors. Furthermore, the fibroids are more common in patients with hyperestrogenic states like obesity and it increase, the size of the fibroids increases after estrogen replacement therapy after menopause. So, those patients who have low body mass index or the, those who are lean and thin, they, they do not have fibroids. As I said, that estrogen induces the increased expression of progesterone receptors. This promotes the oncogenic effect of progesterone and they are more common they increase in size with the presence of progesterone. If we determine the risk factors, it is dependent on the age. And the incidence of fibroids increases with age till on the onset of menopause or after the menopause, the fibroids regress because the, endo the hormonal stimulation is no longer there. Now, the early men uh, menarche and late menopause, both of these things, they are responsible for the development of fibroids and uh, family history, as I already said, first degree relatives are having 3 to 5, 3.5 times more risk of developing fibroids. Body weight index, BMI, that is also related to that and in the diet it has been said that those people who have diet rich in red meat, ham and beef, they have increased risk of fibroids. Now, what, what are the symptoms of what the fibroids are going to produce? Most of them, if they are smaller in size, they are asymptomatic. That is, size of the fibroid less than 4 cm and the uterine size less than 12 cm. They are present in 50 percent of the cases and they are asymptomatic. But if they are symptomatic, they can produce abnormal uterine bleeding, heavy menstrual loss, menorrhagia and uh, uh, sometimes metromenorrhagia because if the fibroid is present in the form of an endometrial polyp, then the surface of the polyp can ulcerate and cause irregular bleeding. Pain or dysmenorrhea is a very common feature, both due to the presence of the fibroids and sometimes there is a slight discomfort due to a colicky pain in the suprapubic region. There can be low backache. The degenerated fibroid or the torsion or a complication in the fibroid can result in acute abdominal pain. They can cause urinary symptoms because the pressure, the increase in the size of the fibroids can compress the urinary bladder and the urethra and that can lead to frequency. Sometimes obstruction of the urinary tract to the extent that the patient can have difficulty in passing urine and at the same time they can cause urinary tract infections, noctiluria because the capacity of the urinary bladder is decreased. Other symptoms which are secondary to the presence of fibroids, these are the progressive development of anemia due to chronic blood loss. So, chronic blood loss leads to ill health. 
loss of appetite and the routine work capacity of the patient is reduced. Some patients they develop polycythemia rarely because they say that this causes a increase in the amount of erythropoietin production and that production can cause polycythemia. The patient can also present with an abnormal mass or lump. Now, what are the complications in a fibroid? The typical complications in the fibroid, they are known as the degenerative changes. The subserosal fibroid, which can be sessile or it can be pedunculated. If a pedunculated fibroid is present in the subserosal region, it can undergo torsion and can result in acute abnormal pain and an abnormal emergency. Or if it's a sessile fibroid, it can sometimes receive can become parasitic and get attached to some other peritoneal structure, resulting in the development of a parasitic fibroid and later on it can be then parasitic on the other structures. Hyaline degeneration is one factor, fatty degeneration that is the development of fatty depositions in the fibroid. Red degeneration is a typical complication of fibroid in pregnancy and in the postpartum period that causes aseptic necrobiosis. The color is red, that is why it is named as red degeneration. Then cystic degeneration, calcification. Calcification can be present in postmenopausal fibroids. If they persist after the menopause, they can be calcification and then hemorrhagic, uh, hemorrhage inside the fibroid. Sarcomatous change in a fibroid is very rare. It is in, uh, present in only less than 1 percent of the cases. Whereas the sarcoma itself, it comes under the heading of malignant uterine tumors and that we will not discuss over here. So, the sarcomatous change is very rare in a fibroid because the other type of sarcoma that arises independent of any fibroid. Then infection or ulceration of a pedunculated fibroid or a fibroid polyp and sometimes it, it can be associated with endometrial carcinoma. So, whenever we find a polyp inside the uterus in the endometrial region, or in the cavity, we must go for endometrial sampling to rule out endometrial carcinoma because of its association. Now, inversion of the uterus. If the fibroid is attached with the uh, peduncle at the fundal area in the cavity, the pressure of that fibroid can cause the uterine cavity to invert. So, inversion is one of the complications. Now, this picture is showing the presence of the different location of the fibroids. This is a pedunculated subserosal fibroid. This one which is located inside the myometrium is called the intramural fibroid. This one which is close to the serosal wall, this is known as the subserosal fibroid. This one is pedunculated and this one is sessile. Similarly, this fibroid which is close to the endometrial cavity, this is the submucosal fibroid. The one which is located close in the cervix, this is the cervical fibroid and this one is called the pedunculated submucosal fibroid. You see that the fibroid is attached with the help of a peduncle to the endometrial surface. So, this is called pedunculated submucosal fibroid and this type of fibroid, if it is attached to the fundus over here, it can cause inversion of the uterus. That is the, fund, the inside of the uterus can come out. That is called inversion. Now, if we look at the gross pathology. A typical fibroid is a well circumscribed tumor with a pseudo capsule and the cut surface is pinkish white and has a world appearance. The capsule is made up of what? The connective tissue which fixes the tumor with the myometrium. This is a false capsule and uh, the vessels that supply the blood to the tumor, they lie in the capsule and send radial branches to the tumor. Hence, the central part of the tumor is comparatively less vascular, thereby degenerative changes are more prominent in the center. Calcification is present at the periphery and spreads inwards along the vessels. Now, if we look at the microscopic picture, the tumor typically consists of bundles of plain cells separated by varying amounts of fibrous strands. Here is the gross picture of the fibroid. The rod is present inside the uterine cavity and you can see a big fibroid which has been bisected into two. This is actually the longitudinal section of the uterus and this area, this is the cavity of the uterus. It is the same picture, uh, uh, same type of a picture but a different, uh, taken from a different patient. Here, this is the fibroid. 
located inside the cavity and this is a submucosal fibroid. It is not pedunculated, but it is a sub, it is a sessile fibroid which is located in the cavity of the uterus. See, these are the few complications which I have just talked about. This is a calcified fibroid. See the color, it is absolutely white, it is hard and this one is hemorrhage inside the fibroid. You can see the hemorrhage and the blood collection inside it. This one is a, it's a radiograph taken. Uh, I, I hope you could also, you could, you could guess what it was actually. This is a fibroid which has undergone calcification and normally the fibroids, they are not visible on radiographs, but since this one is calcified, so this is radio opaque. So, it can be seen on x-ray examination. Now, how do we diagnose? Now, the diagnosis can be confirmed by abdominal examination and by pelvic examination. In the abdominal examination, what we see is that the, the size of the fibroid is more than 12 weeks size of pregnancy. That is, it is above the pubic surfaces, it would be palpable and it has been seen in the history that long, large, very huge amounts of sizes of the fibroids have been noticed. They can give either a unique, uh, very smooth uh, contour to the uterus or they can cause irregular bossing on the surface. If the fibroid is single and is large, it will give a smooth uh, surface to the uterus, whereas if it's, there are multiple fibroids, they can cause an irregular nodular or bossed appearance. A large uterus, if we want to differentiate it from a, a, a fibroid from adenomyosis, then fibroid is firm in nature and non-tender and freely mobile, up and down, but side to side till it incarcerates in the pelvis. See, when we move, we try to, on pelvic examination, we try to move the uterus, the fibroid is going to move with the uterus. Whereas, if it is an ovarian swelling, it will not move with the uterus. This is an ultrasound picture of a fibroid in the, in the cavity of the uterus. You can uh, very well see, this is the circumscribed fibroid inside the cavity of the uterus, this is the cervix and this is the vagina and this is the urinary bladder and these arrows, they are marking the presence of the fibroid. So, what is the differential diagnosis? How would we differentiate it from other things? Now, the first and the foremost thing which has to be differentiated from a fibroid is pregnancy. Whatever we do, we must differentiate it from pregnancy because the fibroid can sometimes reach such sizes that it resembles a normal pregnancy, but the fetal heart tones and fetal parts and they are not typically present. Then full bladder of course. Then the third option is hematometra or pyometra. If a patient has imperforate vagina or imperforate hymen, then she can develop hematometra that is blood inside the uterine cavity and that can mimic a fibroid very easily. Similarly, adenomyosis. Adenomyosis that also gives, increases the size of the uterus, but the consistency of an adenomyotic uterus is far harder than a fibroid and is tender. Biconvert uterus is an abnormality of the uterus and if there are two horns. So, if we can palpate one horn and there is a fibroid in the other horn or we can uh, mimic uh, this bicornate uterus can mimic a fibroid very easily and we can miss the diagnosis. Tubovarian masses, tubovarian masses on either side can present as a, as a mass and that has to be differentiated from a fibroid. Chronic ectopic pregnancy also produces a mass, but we have certain differentiating features like the patient has history of amenorrhea, she has history of irregular bleeding and is tender. Pelvic endometriosis and chocolate cyst, they also present like that, but the typical history of severe dysmenorrhea uh, far more than the bleeding it produces. So, that is uh, true of endometriosis. Endometrial carcinoma, obviously, the age of the patient is important. This is common in uh, those patients who are close to the menopause or those who have crossed the menopause, but fibroids, this is a problem of reproductive age group. Then ovarian neoplasms and paraovarian cyst and pelvic kidney. Abnormality in the development of the urogenital tract 
but the presence of pelvic kidney can also present as a mass in the pelvis and we have to differentiate it from the fibroid. Now, what should we do for the treatment? Number one, we should, if the patient is not symptomatic, the fibroid is not producing any symptoms, then we must wait and we should have a watchful waiting. If he develops symptom, only then we should treat. The things which are used are usually, there is a medical therapy, then there is surgical therapy. Among the medical therapy, the treatment options are NSAIDs, GnRH analogs, agonists, and antagonist. And these are usually given to reduce the size of the fibroids, the GnRH agonist, and the NSAIDs are given to reduce the bleeding, heavy menstrual cycle, the heavy bleeding which is present in association with the fibroids. The surgical treatment options are either we can perform myomectomy by a laparotomy or with the help of a laparoscopy. If the patient is young, she is desirous of more children and she does not want removal of her uterus, then we must go on for myomectomy. The other option is hysteroscopy. If the fibroid is located in the endometrium and is present in the cavity, then hysteroscopic removal of the fibroid is, can be done. Similarly, if this cannot be done, or if the patient is desirous of more children, and we think that uh, myomectomy can result in different adhesion formation, we can use another technique which is called uterine artery embolization. Embolization of the uterine artery can result in the blockage of blood supply to the fibroid and that will result in the shrinkage of the fibroid. Similarly, if the patient is symptomatic with heavy menstrual cycle, then endometrial ablation can be done. Among the medical treatments, the most important, we just discussed that it is dependent on progesterone therapy. So, an antidote, which is a drug which blocks the progesterone, which is known as the mifepristone, is similar to that due to again RH. That is, a trial was carried out and it was so, uh, seen that this causes a reduction in the size of the fibroids and also the reduction in the amount of symptoms it is producing. So, mifepristone or antiprogesterone is a very important uh, drug which can be used for the treatment of fibroids. Similarly, progesterone releasing devices, intrauterine contraceptive devices like Mylena, liver nodgestor containing glazing IUCD, that is a reasonable treatment for selected women of childbearing age with fibroid associated with menorrhagia because this will result in the atrophy of the endometrium and the patient will become asymptomatic. It is not that the fibroid is going to reduce in size, but the, the endometrium is going to become atrophy and the patient would be symptom free. Now, these are, this is a table showing different charts, uh, different doses of the uh, this GnRH analogs. They are triptoraline, the, it is a depot preparation given intramuscularly. Then, gozaraline is the most popular drug uh, available with the name of Zoradex, and this is given in the dose of 3.5, uh, 3.6 milligram subcutaneously monthly. These are all given as monthly injections. If all these things do not work, then we can have an alternative, the surgical management which is myomectomy, in especially in those cases in which the patient wants to retain the uterus. And uh, uh, the, it was, uh, there was uh, a gynecologist named as Victor Boni who invent, invented this uh, myomectomy clamp, which is called Boni's myomectomy clamp. He said that the restoration and maintenance of physiological function is or should be the ultimate goal of surgery. So, in very carefully selected cases, myomectomy can be safely performed. Now, one thing which I want to specially mention is that myomectomy at the time of cesarean section, that if the patient is having fibroids and she is pregnant and she is going to deliver, then we can perform cesarean section and if the fibroid is pedunculated, only then that fibroid should be removed. If it is intramural or at some other location, it should not be removed because it, that can lead to torrential hemorrhage and sometimes we have to resort to cesarean hysterectomy. So, we have to be very careful about that. Now, this is the typical Boney's myomectomy clamp. We talked about Victor Boney. This clamp at the time of myomectomy is used and is applied at the level of internal loss to compress the uterine arteries bilaterally and that reduces the bleeding during surgery. It is very helpful. This one is the myoma screw. Now, when the, cavity, when the uterus, uh, when the abdominal cavity is opened and the uterus is exposed, 
An incision is made on the most prominent part of the fibroid and as the wall of the uterus is separated, the, the myoma can be enucleated with the help of this screw. See, this is a laparoscopic uh, myomectomy and these are the different pictures. You can see that this one is the, this is the bossing created by the fibroid and here the skin has been given. This is the, the screw which has been inserted into the fibroid and now this is going to be evacuated or enucleated from the from the cavity of the fibroid. Hysteroscopic removal, I talked about it. Some mucous fibroids can be removed by this uh, means and uh, then the fibroid can be removed either by electric pottery or laser or resectoscope. Uterine artery uh, embolization is relatively a newer technique which is carried out uh, for uh, uh, for larger fibroids and where the patient does not form a, a surgical option. So, under the technique is that under local anesthesia, bilateral uterine artery is approached through percutaneous femoral catheterization using polyvinyl alcohol gel. These particles are injected in the artery supplying the fibroid. I will show you a picture. Uh, yeah, this is the picture of uterine artery embolization. Here you can see that these the catheter has been passed and this is this has entered into the uterine artery and these polyvinyl particles these are and blocking the blood supply of this particular fibroid and later on this is going to regress. Okay. So hysterectomy is the option, ultimate option for the treatment of fibroids. For those women who are over 40 years of age, they are multiples and they have, uh, they don't, uh, they are not desirous of any more children. The fibroids are complicated, they are having severe symptoms and we see that it is difficult to remove the, uh, the fibroids because maybe because of their location. So, at that time, hysterectomy is the best option and most probably the hysterectomy is, should be abdominal. We should try to remove the, uh, the uterus in total, that is the uterus and the cervix and uh, prefer we should prefer total abdominal hysterectomy rather than subtotal hysterectomy. I think this is the end of the slide. Thank you.